My name is Darren Porter. I am a fisherman. It is not only what I do, it is who I am. I fish for heron and a few other species in the Minas Basin. The Minas Basin is located at the very end of the Bay of Fundy. We are home to the highest tides in the world. It's the rise and fall of these tides that allows me to catch fish in a traditional kind of trap known as a weir. This is my weir. It is one of the last operating weirs in the Minas Basin. Because of our huge tidal range, the weir uncovers completely at low tide, which is when we harvest our catch. When I was a kid, I traveled the basin up on the Hansport side, and as I got older, I'd travel up to Kennecock and all those rivers and Cobham Gun, and I'd see these stuff. And uh, you wouldn't see them like this, where there's a whole bunch together. You'd see one here, then one over there. I could never figure out what they were. As I got older, I learned that they were the remains of old fishing weirs. At one time, there was a weir for every mile of the Minas Basin, each weir's design being different from the others, a reflection of the men and women who built them, as well as the differences of the terrain that they were built. I believe the long history of this style of fishing is testament to its sustainability. Um, I started the weir because of an opportunity to buy a weir from a gentleman down in Walton. Um, it was an added bonus to uh, what I already did, which was a gas pro fishing in the Abram River. There's not much um, in the Minas Basin, especially on the Hans King side, that you can do to make a living um, as a fisherman. Of course, I want to stay a fisherman, so the weir was a, was a perfect opportunity to expand and improve upon my income. And I finally got the chance, I jumped on it, and uh, I basically studied um, how to build uh, weirs on my own and uh, through every person I could find, I guess, and every venue, like the internet and stuff like that. And because and, uh, all around the world, they've always been used. Uh, weir fishing is very old style fishing, right back to the Mi'kmaq, and you go over to uh, Vikings and Europe, and every culture has basically had some form of a weir fishery. We start cutting our poles for the next season during the fall. We need around a thousand poles and reuse as many as we can and recycle the others into braces and stubs. We cut most of our poles by carefully thinning our woodlot, which keeps our woodlot healthy and our ecological footprint as small as possible. We start the weir um, basically as soon as the uh, ice and the weather allows us. We wait for the uh, set of tides to start falling from the high running tides down, and we have to make I have to make a judgment call of when the ice is going to leave, and then we start building. Usually, most years it's around middle of March, first of March, but last year was the first of April because we had a long winter. <laughs> In the spring we build as fast as possible, as it takes about 75 to 100 tides to build. The weir consists of two wings to guide the fish towards the trap, each wing generally over a thousand feet. The end of each wing resembles a candy cane, which attempts to divert the fish back towards the trap. Where the wings meet, we build a trap. Years ago the weirs were built completely by interweaving brush, but now we use a mix of nylon netting and brush. These nets are hung on the square as they are not intended to gill fish, they are intended to guide fish.
When all the poles were in, we braced them to withstand the pressure of the tides as well as the constant pounding of the waves. The brush on the bottom is held down by rocks. It seals the nets to the ocean floor as silt builds up around the brush. The trap is covered with netting intended to minimize escape. The entrance is precisely planned to maximize capture. The bottom two or three feet of the trap, as well as 100 feet either side of the trap, are completely sealed up with boards, brush, and rocks to create a pond to keep the fish alive until we harvest. We usually start fishing the weir about halfway through construction. We only have a limited time before the tide returns. We only catch a small portion of fish within our area each tide. This has a very low impact on the environment. We put brush on the top as well as the bottom. The brush on the top is meant to discourage fish from swimming over the weir as the tide falls. Okay. Once we start fishing, I am tied to the weir every low tide, seven days a week, two tides a day, except on the occasional low running tide that keeps us from harvesting the fish, or if I unlock my gate the tide before, which allows the fish to pass through. I'm Erica Porter. I am a worker at the Bramber Weir, and Darren Porter is my father. And uh, I also own a commercial fishing license. I love it right here. I do every aspect of work from beginning to end. I especially like working the gate, as I am the first one to see what species come out. Most weirs are fished from the inside, but ours has a gate system that allows us to fish from the outside. It lets us flush fish from the trap a batch at a time so we can sort the amount we want and still keep the remaining fish alive within. First of the season, the species we see most are tomicod and herring. Then we start seeing a few gaspro, shad and flounder in the yard sculpin. By mid-May, our catches increase, being mostly herring. By mid-June, the herring drop off. Some years we are lucky to get a few hits of shad, the squid numbers increase, and the flounder picks up a bit. We have seen close to 50 different species at the weir. Over 80% of these species are not harvested. In the old days, they never had holding ponds like we have. Um, that holding pond is actually, a, I found, a similar type a pond, not quite the same in Scandinavia. In a picture, uh, picture on the internet. Anyway, that's where I get the idea for that holding pond, which allows us to uh, to uh, save more fish than what we'd be able to save if uh, we didn't have it. Nowadays, we're not allowed to keep every species, so the challenge is to try to keep the species alive that you're not allowed to keep and sell. So um, if we don't want it, or we can't sell it, or we're not allowed to take it. Our job is to keep it alive, so continuously we're always trying to improve our system of how we keep things alive and and uh, to make us make us the greenest or cleanest weir um, or fishery. The recovery pond uh, is a place where any of the fish that aren't harvested or aren't kept for whatever reason, uh, they can go into the recovery pond and survive. There's a couple feet of water, uh, and they can sit there until the tide comes in and picks them up. Um, so this is really important for our tagging programs and our research, and it's, um, it's definitely an attraction out at the Weir. Everyone loves coming out to see what's in the recovery pond, and actually this year uh, there were a lot of people from Acadia that really wanted to come and help build it because it is such an important part of the Weir, and this year we actually decided to build it in the shape of a heart um, because we love fish. <laughs> the Weir provides an opportunity for scientists in my area to do meaningful long-term research that benefits the ecosystem. This is extremely important to me. When we first started working out here, it was sort of one small project, which turned into a larger project, which turned into four or five fairly significant projects. And 
there are a lot of different students that work out here. There's a few different labs. And really, without the weir, we wouldn't be able to do any of this research. We tag several species out here. We tag winter and little skates and striped bass, and we also help out with some sturgeon tagging. We were looking for a project, and Darren happened to note that the one thing that's here from start to finish are the skates. And looking further into their situation, no one's actually ever looked at them in the inner bay of Fundy. Uh, with this being such a unique environment, obviously with the highest tides in the world, uh, the species that we're working with have adapted to that, um, which is one of the reasons why it's critical for us to understand their populations in this area. And that is why we're doing our, our tagging program. So we tag skates as well as striped bass. And the information that we're collecting from that, so when any tagged fish returns to us at the weir, it actually can lead us to uh, make population estimates. And these population estimates are going to help us uh, in their future as their habitat continues to change so that we have a baseline of information for us to compare it to. We're here at the weir to sample Atlantic sturgeon that get caught. Um, so we are doing acoustic tagging and satellite tagging of the fish um, to look at population specific movement patterns around the Minas Basin um, and spawning behavior in the rivers around the Minas Basin. Um, and Atlantic sturgeon are considered uh, threatened in Canada so it's just that much more important to understand their movements and behaviors in this area. Water. Get a big one in, With the acoustic tagging, we have receivers deployed around the Minas Basin um, at various locations. And when a tagged fish comes within about 500 meters of these receivers, they'll get picked up. So their ID code will be recorded. Um, and with the satellite tagging, we're hoping to get you know, very specific depth and temperature data from the sturgeon we tag. Um, so, and in terms of spawning behavior, we've got receivers um, up rivers to detect their movements going up river. Industry is developing and over time, you know, economic value is going to shift. So different species are going to come to be more valuable and less valuable. And we're, we have the, you know, addition of tidal power turbines and that's going to change their environment. So in the future, when we have even more impacts on their populations in their environment, we need to have um, baseline information to look back on so that we're properly able to assess, okay, what has the impact been? Has there been an impact? Or um, for my species like skate, if we weren't doing this research now, we wouldn't have any information to look back on. So we would never know um, what, their, what historically their populations looked like. There are some students who look at population demographics of lady crab and squid, and we also look at embryonic development of squid. And just because we have the opportunity out here, we also do some measurements with dogfish sharks and eels, um, just because we're interested. Our fish is sold as bait to the lobs industry. The current government regulations do not allow us to process our own fish. There are many laws like these in our fishery that limit our potential as well as our growth and don't let us maximize the value of our product. As the fish are being harvested, we start weighing them and putting them on ice, which enables us to have a top quality product. Then as the tide returns, we must leave and return to shore, where the fish is distributed to the buyers. We're always constantly improving, constantly trying to catch more fish. Um, everything, on every stick on this weir has a purpose, and its purpose is to improve either uh, uh, to eliminate bycatch, or to increase our catch, or to eliminate downtime, right, and ease of everything. Like there's a, it's very well thought out.
like everything's very well thought out here because we cannot afford to miss a tide like literally last year i mean i paid everybody by two thousand dollars i was over you know what i mean so there's no money left so you've got to you've got to make sure you do everything perfect the first time to make sure this show still runs uh, we involve the community in the, the weir fully as in the past all these weirs were actually community run there'd be three households basically run a single weir so I involve the whole community we have we have uh, we have many people come out last this year than normal but the shorter season as well but uh, late last year with 3,000 year before about 3,500 people come out and um, we do schools we do seminars we do a bunch of awareness um, I also um, take great pride in being able to show people um, the operation, get to educate them on what's in their basin so they begin to love it because most people just looked out and drove across the Windsor Causeway, they see a bunch of mud, see a bunch of dirty water, there's nothing alive in it. <coughs> they come down here and uh, I show them it's far different than that. There's all kinds of life here. There's all kinds of beauty. There's all kinds of species, right? And it's very important to get people, um, for me, it's very important for people to uh, learn what's here and love what's here because we have um, five major uh, industries coming in here. We have rare minerals, we have salt caverns, we have fracking, we have the two turbine companies, right? Um, so the more people I educate on what's here, the more people love what's here. Basically in July nobody really wants your fish because they got to freeze it. So I tie in with somebody that says that uh, they'll hold me through so I don't got to worry about trying to paddle fish or not having things ready and, and I don't have a freezing unit so so uh, basically we got to uh, we got to tie in anyways the buyer decided to uh, renege on our deal which left us with left with it left us uh, dead in the water Uh, today we are not uh, fishing the weir. We are just, uh, but we have to make sure that no big fish get caught in the trap. And make sure they all swim through. So that's what I'm here to do today. We must have missed 20, 30 tides now. Must be close, and which is a lot of money. That's my profit. If there is any profit in the season, which this year there would have been profit. Last year there was no profit at the end. It was break even if I was lucky, right? This year we were doing really well in the spring. We caught a lot of fish. And uh, so now it was my money for a change. And uh, he just shut the door, shut us down, stopped coming, and uh, left us out in the cold, basically. It forced me to get out and find new industry, like the halibut industry. We got some bait for the halibut industry this week, which is a new industry. They were pretty excited to find us, right? Because they, they don't have any fish in April, which is also a hard month, a little bit harder to sell in April because the seasons aren't open, but most of the bars will take your fish and freeze it because it's beginning. But uh, they want fresh bait in April because they can't get it nowhere else. We have fresh bait in April, right? So then, you know, we can, and then in July, they still run the boats so we can sell to them. And uh, if we get a good enough relationship with them, maybe they'll freeze, they said they might freeze some of our bait in April and sell it to their uh, lobster season when they open up in November. And the good that comes out of it is the fact they forced me by not paying me my money and by cutting me off to find new markets. And uh, it's very hard to find new markets, right? And we got lucky enough to find some. So we're down for this year, basically. We're, if we're lucky, we can fish one or two days a week now. And we still have all this up. We still got to tear it all down, right? So, I mean, we're just sitting here waiting because, I mean, you need every cent you can make. It's not like uh, once, the, once we tear it down, there's no more money until next April, May, right? When the fish sails dry up, we'd be in the massive task of tearing the weir down. The amount of nails and spikes to be pulled always seems endless. The poles and braces are barnacle covered and waterlogged. It takes around 50 tides to tear the weir down. Only a few stubs left as evidence that there once stood a mighty weir, leaving virtually no footprint. Working at the weir has taught me that I can overcome anything and it has made any other challenges in my life seem easy. Every day is different and that's what I love about it. It's a job not many would attempt to do. We lift thousands of pounds of fish daily by hand. Working twice a day every day with no time off doesn't leave much time for sleep. 
but I enjoy the beautiful sunsets and sunrises, the different types of fish in our ocean, and the many different people that accompany us day to day. We sort and pack everything away, mend all of our nets, recreate our supplies for next year, and once again the cycle begins. I am truly blessed with a profession that allows me to put smiles on so many people's faces, as well as introduce them to a world of water and the creatures that live within. But they have otherwise no way to see. I truly believe if I can get the people to love the ocean and its creatures, then they will protect them. But I mean, we can't. I can't stop fishing. <laughs> How do you stop fishing? I mean, you can't. Like, you, you, either I'll be in the river, or I'll be here, or I'll do both. Just uh, how many? Just, just the way it is, right? You just can't stop because you got too much investment. If I go get a job, how am I going to pay my bills? I over $200,000. So how do you pay your bills? Right? You know, can't make that at McDonald's.